but our next speaker is Josh Moore. He'll be talking about evolutionary security, embrace failure, and survive. Josh has over 15 years of experience in IT and information security, and Josh runs his own security firm, which I'll have to talk to him about uh, after the event is concluded. Thank you very much. Take it away, Josh. Okay, hopefully my mic is still working. Sounds like it is. I don't know always say, you know, raise your hand if you can't hear me, but in the back, if you can hear me, raise your hand. Excellent, that works. All right, quick introduction. Me. As you can see, I've been at this for a while. And this is what I do. Uh, more seriously, I started Air Security because I got tired of seeing constant failure in uh, IT and InfoSec. Um, and uh, you know, started looking elsewhere for solutions. Started exploring psychology, different aspects of science, economics, and stuff like that. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is what I learned digging into the biology and evolutionary fields. So uh, we have to start, as all talks in evolution do, by compressing four billion years into 20 seconds. <coughs> um, life started as single globs, which turned into true animals as they started to aggregate. Um, you know, animals started to evolve bones and teeth, getting stronger, uh, moving faster. They got legs, uh, they moved to land where certain animals found less competition and they thrived there for a while. Um, certain, oh, that's the move to land slide, sorry. Um, some animals developed hair, uh, you know, grew claws, became able to climb. The important thing there is they were able to then expand into yet more areas of the world that did not have competition, did not have predators. Um, then, you know, social intelligence evolved. You started to see animals forming groups and defending one another from attacks, <coughs> taking care of one another, and then, um, you know, developing a form of, um, of environmental intelligence, choosing how to live, developing tools. So that's the overall arcing scope of what we're going to be looking at. So and it's not moving forward. All right. So it's doing this to me on the plane. I really hoped it would not happen in real life. All right, so we'll just, um, all right, we'll pretend there's something on the screen there. Um, in security, everything constantly changes. Okay, we're using, there we go. Sorry. Okay, so, quick clarification, natural evolution is random, okay? In the real world that we deal with, as far as um, these sorts of issues that we see, you know, animals evolving in competition with one another, mutations are random, the mutations that succeed thrive, the mutations that don't die. In business, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one metaphor, because in business we can make choices choices that you can't make if you're just re you know, relying on a gamma ray to hit a cell that causes something random to happen. Um, in business, if we're guiding in the right direction, we can result in success. If we guide in the wrong direction, we can result in failure. So if you have a, a, a biological background, anybody here have a biological background? Excellent. If you did, this is just a metaphor. Last time I gave this talk, somebody came up to me afterwards and was very precise about the things I sort of glossed over. So if you want to pick on me later, please do. I can take it. All right. Now when the slides update, in security, everything constantly changes. Okay. Evolution is a good model, but like I said, it's only a model. Natural evolution um, has resulted in very complex organisms. In general, the more complex an organism, the longer it lives. Because of the complexity, it takes more time to get these next, the next generation, which is why you tend to see these very large firms, these very complex firms and very complex technology last for a very long time. Um, if you've worked with security technology in particular, you might find very complex security technology lasts longer in the marketplace than you really think it should. And that's because the more complex something is, not only the harder it is to make it work, the harder it is to kill it in many cases. So that's something that we see. Um, intelligence, uh, we see resulting in tools. Tools tends to speed things back up. 
because it takes so long to make a very complex business or a very complex technology, we see tools coming in to speed the cycle. So, you know, as humans, we live maybe 80 years. You know, let's pick that as a nice, you know, average. Um, we can improve our standards of lives. Like, you know, who here is like over 35? I guess a lot of us are. How much has technology changed in the last 35 years? I mean, it's changed a lot. We've had a lot of evolutionary cycles just in the consumer tech space. We're seeing a lot of evolutionary cycles in the, um, in the infosec tech space as well. We see it in IT all the time. You know, Amazon has, you know, their, their release cycles are down to hours. Like, the, sometimes they release every 10 minutes. You know, some companies have a much longer uh, cycle than that. But basically, by applying intelligence to the evolutionary process, we're able to hit this arms race a little bit faster. So we see this in, in InfoSec. So, you know, we start to see an attacker studying the landscape, figure out what kind of attacks they want to do. It makes things a little bit stressful for the defenders. And then like, like we started to see when you know, apes started to work together, uh, we see attackers working together, amplifying the attacks, bouncing ideas off of one another, trying to improve what they're doing, which makes things even harder for the defenders. Most of us in this room, I assume, are defenders. Most of us have dealt with systems that are on fire. It's uh, not pleasant, and unfortunately, more of them are catching on fire the further we go. So, in the InfoSec arms race, we see the attackers, you know, they started by just trying to hammer on a network, right? We put up firewalls, we fixed that problem. And then we started to see the attackers moving the focus inside, looking at users. You know, this would be the email attacks that we started to see maybe 10 years ago, maybe 15. I don't know how old I am now. Um, you know, if this is spam, this is what, you know, the malvertising where people take over uh, an uh, advertising server and start serving malware to, to um, companies and social engineering attacks. So the, the defense got more complex, you know, to respond to these. Now, what's interesting is there are different market forces at work. Um, the market evolution of vendors faces a different sort of environment than the attackers do. Because for the attackers to succeed, you know, what success looks like in that evolutionary cycle on the attack side is they have to win against somebody. For a defender to succeed, they have to get enough profit in a cycle to get through that cycle and get to the next thing. But for a vendor to succeed, they have to succeed against other vendors. And that means that they're competing directly, feature to feature, against all these other vendors to get somebody to buy them. So you tend to see feature proliferation. You tend to see things happening in vendor space that is driven by the competition between vendors, not competition against attackers. You see attacker competition too. You know, it's not to say they're just spending their time fighting one another, but there's another force that you don't see if you're not in the vendor space. And that's a force that slows down the evolutionary cycle. If you slow down the evolutionary cycle, the faster the attackers move, the faster they're going to be able to take over. So while the defense market has gone towards increasing complexity, the attackers have moved to lighter tools, faster tools, faster ways to get in and get out with the data and resources they want. So their advantages compound, and they're able to take the resources they steal and put them back into their development processes and improve as they go. So, you know, the shorter their cycles are, the faster they can get better. But if you're a vendor that's releasing on a, on a yearly basis, they can only improve within that year. So defenders, in addition to being hampered by the vendor space, are hampered by budgets, by training opportunities, and by whatever laws, regulations, and institutional processes they're facing. That's basically their environment. That's what they're having to respond to. So not only in the defense space are we losing, but we're losing faster every day. So we're going to take a brief uh, diversion into economics. Evolution rewards change, and change is uncomfortable. So uh, we tend to experiment with uh, dealing with this through social structure. Markets are one form of the social structure. 
and they are unbelievably complex. You know, I might be able to give an overview of evolution in 20 seconds. I can't give an overview of economics in 20 seconds. It's way too complex. So we'll just assume that in the purest form, it's different groups of people competing with one another. Okay? And they're competing for resources. They're competing for money. Um, they're competing for prestige. In evolutionary security, they're competing for power. Markets, among many of the other things they do, they amplify differences between classes of people. Okay, if anybody's been following the national dialogue on privilege and you know, racism and things like that, that's one aspect of this. Within our world, what happens is the people at the top get more power, they get more money, they get to drive the direction that things go. This happens in companies, this happens in industries, this happens in the attacker space. We use this economic model to provide violence without bloodshed. It's a constant war where each person has their own goals, their own desires, and their own resources, and they win by leveraging other people's resources to maximize their own gains. Markets exist to help people pool resources. So, whenever my slide updates, there we go. Not updating for you, updating for me. Um, as markets mature, this attack defense, this sort of violence that they existed to replace. You know, because back when you, know, you needed to create money, it's because you, know, you wanted to have something to trade instead of actually trading chickens and you know, stealing chickens from your neighbors and things like that. Markets have shifted um, into information. And evolution changes those defenses. To prevent chaos, rules have been made. You know, we have rules of engagement around how you deal with money, around how you deal with um, you know, the information that's out there. And different markets have different rules. This is one of the reasons why we have conflicts with globalization. Because the rules of the mar markets, not the trading floors, but the actual, the way markets actually function in Asia, in Africa, in India, in the US, South America, they're all different. And we try to pretend they're the same, but they're not. And that's going to cause problems. However, we have a general sense of fairness. We have a general sense that people that abuse the rules the most are going to get thrown in jail or in some markets killed. Um, and we expect people to not brazenly use inside knowledge to manipulate markets to steal their money. But the rules are not always followed. That's something to remember. Because in an evolutionary context, it's warfare. It's constant fighting for position to get resources in whatever way you possibly can. And whatever rules we have written down are probably going to be followed. But that gap between probably and always is just large enough to hurt. So as it, we wait for it to update here. OK. Evolution is iterative, based on constant improvement. And the concept of better is highly dependent on the environment. There is no ultimate plan. There is no ultimate goal. Has anybody here worked in small business? In small business, the goal is not necessarily to make money. It's to make enough money to make payroll. Okay? It's about surviving to the next ascent. Um, it works the same way in large business, but the people worried about survival is the shareholders and some people at the top. Most people are sheltered from that, that worry. In markets, the idea of win is profit. But it's important to realize that it's profit. It's not all the money. It's not a zero-sum game. It's making more than you started with. In evolution, the win is good enough. It's surviving for the next generation. Now, who here knows much about pandas? Sounds like a diversion, right? Pandas evolved to eat bamboo. Okay? Pandas evolved to eat bamboo because there's a lot of bamboo in Asia. There's tons of it there, and nobody else was eating it. So they had this resource that was freely available. They could then eat it. They could thrive. Now, what happens is, as they do that, as they specialize, other animals in Asia started eating other food supplies, the kind of food that bears normally eat. 
and the bears were kind of further isolated to only eating bamboo, to the point where they were physically dependent on the least nutritious plant in Asia. And then you have humans come along that think, hey, that bamboo is pretty good. You know, we can make chopsticks out of it. We can make floors. We can make, um, you know, we can make clothing. Or we can plow it under and build houses. And there was less and less bamboo to go around. And basically, the panda is being outcompeted by man and all the other animals that uh, are eating its food supply. Now, in contrast, there's honey. Right? Bees make honey. You would think pandas would eat honey. Bears like honey. We've all read Winnie the Pooh. Doesn't work that way. Humans and the bears that weren't pandas found it quite like it, and they spread bees everywhere. Back when colonization was happening in, in what's now called the U.S., bees that were brought over by the Europeans preceded humans to the point where the Native Americans called them the white man's flies, and took over the entire ecosystem. Bees were remarkably successful, evolutionarily speaking until we started putting pesticides everywhere. And uh, there's some other indications I can talk to you after that's way off topic. Um, but they became successful by depending on humans. And that has eventually turned on. The same thing happens with partnerships in business. You can grow together great with another business as long as you're going in the same direction. But if at some point, the evolution or the, the environmental factors change, that that business can do better without you than with you, they'll do it. That's how business works, because it's a state of nature. You know, it's constant warfare, constant fighting for the resources that are available. Another thing to realize is evolution is nonlinear. There's more than one way to do it. You know, lots of different animals out there have wings. Birds, bats, bugs fish, squid, they're a squid with wings, flying squid, look pretty cool. And if you evolve something and you later don't need it, there's no reason to keep it. We have blind cave fish. There are whales that used to have legs. You know, snakes used to have legs too. Um, basically, we're in a situation where if we need something, we have a chance of getting it. And if we don't need something, we have a chance of getting rid of it. But we're not on a goal. We're not heading all in the same direction with the same idea in mind. And because, you know, even though cave fish got rid of eyes, a lot of us have eyes. You know, those are still around. This, anything that works is kept in an evolutionary context. Anything that works is kept in an information security context. Success is about resource management and trade-offs. Which gets us into old versus new at some point. So we have old technology out there, right? We have, um, we have malware that is out there uh, that has been written in the 1980s. It's still on the internet. If you plug a machine from 1995, like Windows 95 directly in the internet, it's going to be compromised. Why? there are still attacks out there for that operating system. There are still attacks out there for NT. There are attacks for XP, as we're seeing a lot of. They never go away. They're there all the time. And what we tell people, we tell consumers, you know, keep your system patched, don't run as admin, you'll be fine. You know, maybe you're an antivirus. Because that's where we think is reasonable for them. We tell people in the financial industry, you know, worry about denial of, uh, distributed denial of service. Worry about malware. We tell people in research and development, you know, worry about intellectual property theft. We tell small business, firewall. You've got to have a firewall here. Firewall and AV, you'll be good. The truth is these are all true. Okay? The old attacks don't go away. The viruses are there. You can't ignore the old threats, but you can't ignore the new ones either. And attacks are going to depend on your adversary's goals and capabilities. And in fact, there are four general tiers of attacks. This is something I think is very important to remember. Okay? It's not just them against us. It's different types of them against different types of us. So at the bottom level there, we have what I call the tier one attackers. This is the background radiation of the internet. Okay? These are people that collect systems, 
compromise as many as they can and save them for later. Tier two, you have groups that are vertically focused. These are people that are mal you know, malware cartels that are running campaigns against specific industries. And I was involved in defending against a campaign that was targeting religious-based nonprofits. That was their job that quarter, was to focus on that industry and take out as many as they could. At tier three, you have industry-focused attacks. These are going after intellectual property. So these are people that may have like a two-year project dedicated to the US pharmaceutical industry. So you know, we're just gonna go after whatever we can get from these, these particular sets of businesses. And at the top tier, you have targeted. This is uh, what has been called APT. Um, these are fundamentally groups that are aimed at stealing intellectual property in process as it's being developed. This is long-term attackers. These people that are trying to target companies that are actively developing something and watching their development efforts so they can take, they can take the information and build their own. If you've read the, uh, the expose on how Nortel went away, this is the type of group that did that. Now, if you're defending against these kind of attackers, you have to do it in different ways. Tier one attackers, AV patching, you're done. You know, you've set yourself above basic, and everybody who doesn't do the basics is gonna get taken over. Tier two, you need something more advanced. Anti-malware, whitelisting, sandboxing technologies, things like that. This is where you can get some, some competitive advantage. Because if your industry is being targeted by a cartel, and you can manage to get your protection above average, everybody else in the industry is, or that's below you is going to be taken over. Because when the campaign ends, they're going to move on. They're not going to keep pounding on you. You know, that's going to end. They're going to move on to the next group. And you can actually get some leverage over your competition there. Now, this requires vigilance. People are lazy. So security tends to weaken over time. Tier three, you need to add monitoring and operational practices. Those of you that are not in, um, in um, not a college, um, anyway, there's a talk on metrics next door. That's the kind of thing you need to do here. You need to be gathering uh, metrics, you need to be gathering data, looking at what's going on, and figuring out what you're gonna do. This is where automation comes in, where you start moving faster and faster, and you know, you have attackers that are like bacteria specializing on species, except they're specializing on industries. And you wind up, the more protections you put in place, creating antibiotic resistance. As an industry, so look, we'll take the, um, the, let's take financial industry for an example, right? Financial industry is under constant attack by people outside of the US. And the ones that are falling behind are the ones that are gonna get taken over. The ones that are doing better, like once everybody starts doing better, you know, once the low hanging fruit's been picked off by the bad guys, then the bad guys have to step up their game. And by stepping up our defenses in that industry, we're making the attackers better and better and better because if they don't get better, they're gonna die. That's how we're incentivizing them. Tier four, there's no standardized advice custom targeted, they likely know your network better than you do. The attacks are going to be customized, the defense has to be as well. This is where attack defense security shifts from being an infosec problem to, to, live to only being a business problem. You know, that's when you have to worry about that. So, so you know, we're in this model where we have these different levels and knowledge is your best weapon. To succeed, you have to know your organization, know how it fails, know your weak points and when they're gonna be exploited, know what you must learn and develop a plan. So, one thing to look at is complexity versus simplicity. Simple systems are easy to learn. They tend not to do much. Complex systems do a lot, but they're not as easy to understand. If something goes wrong with a simple system, you can troubleshoot it like that. Simple systems recover more quickly. Smaller organizations using simpler services, basic applications are more resilient than your large businesses that are dependent on the critical app. You know, particularly the critical app 
that was written in the 1990s and updated very slightly as the business required to today. However, complex systems are, <coughs> are more powerful and they can take over a market if the niche is right. Okay? Complex systems like operating systems. Now everybody here know the Microsoft story? Okay? Microsoft went up against heavy Unix. Microsoft won against heavy Unix because it was simpler. Not because it was simpler to use, but because it was simpler to license. Simpler licensing models allowed it to grow in niches that didn't exist, that Unix was not able to function. Home computers on Unix based would not be possible. And nobody's going to spend that kind of licensing dollars to get a computer to play solitaire on. But you can pay a couple hundred bucks and get one for Microsoft. And as Microsoft evolved, you know, they found these heavy Unix customers coming to them and say, look, you know, we want to go with you because you're cheaper, but these guys have a database and you don't. And Microsoft SQL Server was born. You know, mail server was needed, so they, they created um, Exchange. And you saw these changes happen, and Microsoft got more and more and more complex. And eventually, it was too complex for some of the simpler tasks that people needed. And that's where Linux came along. Linux was simpler, not to use, to license. It was free in a lot of cases. And you could put up a, a web server very simply. You could put up a mail server very simply because you didn't need to buy the whole stack that Microsoft had blown it into. So you wound up seeing Linux you know, running the World Wide Web, running companies like Amazon <coughs> and Google, you know, running routers, running switches, running the entire internet. And the competition level shifted. And we start to see competition now in the mobile phone market. Basically, you've got simplicity, you've got complexity, and they're both valid evolutionary strategies if you know where you are with respect to the competition. Learning plans uh, requires change. Okay? Understanding what you're doing you know, requires learning, but there are different ways to learn. Using evolution as a model, there are three types. There's natural evolution. More change results in more rapid improvement. But change has both positives and negatives. Changes in general are more likely to be negative, particularly if they're not planned. Too many changes results in failure. You know, if you have an organism, too many mutations, it's going to die. It's going to become cancerous and just fall apart. Too few changes is going to result in failure because of competition. You know, animals that don't evolve to respond to changing environments are just going to be outcompeted. Food's going to go away like the panda, and they're going to die. Success involves moving just fast enough to not be hit by the bad mutations and fast enough to evolve generationally so you can respond to what's going on. Guided evolution is a bit different. This is tool level improvement. This is looking at something and thinking, I, I can make this better. You know, we've done this with plows, we've done this with swords, um, we've done this with horses. You know, making horses run faster, pull heavier loads. Those with cows, making the cows make more milk. As technology improves, directed by intelligence, it's still evolution, it's just guided. And the speed depends on the analysis of current flaws, the tool's complexity. Basically, it's easier to make a new hammer than an orbital telescope or a cow. You know, some things can move more quickly than others. Now there's automated adaptation, this is where we are today. Technology is starting to change itself. We see um, technological evolution with guidance, adaptive response is metric based learning. Metrics is rapid determination is this change good or is this change bad? And allows you to optimize for the short term, focusing on the now, focusing on faster change. We see iterative chip design, we see polymorphic code coming out in malware we see automated algorithm resulting in faster iterations. And we get into metrics. Metrics, you know, anybody go, go to Siricon? You know about Siricon? Okay, it's a metrics-based security con 
that focuses on what's, you know, what to measure, what to look at. If metrics are not collected fast enough and reviewed, you're not getting enough data, you're going to be wasting time and money. It's common with a metrics project to start, get a little bit of success, and then stop. You see failure because you forget why you're measuring. You see this with your technology. The first firewall was great. The second firewall was even better because they improved the user interface. And eventually, you started seeing copycat firewalls. They were copying the interface, but not functionality. And you started to see these copycat firewalls that were getting worse. We're seeing this today with antivirus, intrusion prevention, and other technologies. There's a difference between doing the analysis yourself and copying others. Do the analysis yourself, you're able to improve, look at what the attackers are doing, look at what you're doing as a business, and respond. If you copy others, you get to improve your golf game. The idea of set and forget security is a lie. You get failure from ignoring your problems in life and in business. You get failure by not measuring where you should. You get improvement by focusing on where you can be a leader, where you can be more worth less, where you cannot compete your competition. Because that's what your competition's doing. Whether the competition is in your industry or is one of your attackers. Success involves moving faster than the attackers in the right direction. You can't overcommit. If you move too fast, you're going to basically be creating too much change in your environment. You're going to be creating mutation. So you have to move a little bit slower than that, but you know, you can't move too slow. Success is improving faster, not crashing and burning. Has anybody read the book Flow? No? You should read it. It's a great book. Okay. Flow is about the balance between anxiety and boredom. It's this psychological mode you can get into where the work just kind of drops away and you're getting it done, but you're not thinking about what am I doing, how am I doing it, what do I have to do next. You're just kind of flowing through work. Businesses can do this too. At a personal level, when you're in flow, all sense of time is lost. At an evolutionary level, though, your sense of comfort isn't going to cut it. You're, you're going to be outcompeted by those that are pushing into the anxiety level. Now, if you push too far into anxiety, you wind up burning out. Um, did everybody read the Amazon article that came out last week about how horrible it is to work there? Okay. It, it's being contested by some that work there, but that's an example of a company that is really focused on anxiety. Anxiety is a driver for getting important things done. I'm sure we all know companies that focus on the border side. Okay. If you look at this like a riverbank, where you have to move ever closer to anxiety, sort of cutting in to that bank of the river every time you move forward, just a little bit anxious, you're going to slowly move to where you're improving how things are working. You know, the boring stuff, the stuff that's down here, is getting automated so you have to deal with it. And you're able to focus more on what's causing you anxiety and finding out, hey, maybe this isn't so bad. And overall, as a business, performance improves. Now, accelerating a team is easier said than done. You know, first you need to plan something, then people generally do it, and uh, they generally leave little time to correct if something bad happens. When you look at things from a lean security perspective, you look at it from sprints. First, you assess everything. You know, figure out where are what could possibly happen, and you adjust as you go. You think, hey, this could be a problem. This could be a problem we have to deal with. Let's deal with it, and then create resiliency for the business. Basically, when you're building a map for your business, the map has to conform to the world. You cannot assume the world will conform to your map. That never works. The advantage of this approach is that goals and resources change, and you have to adapt accordingly. The disadvantage is you have to trust and have accountability for people, because you can't do it all yourself. And by going through this process, this evolutionary process where you look at what's coming, figure out what does this mean to us, how do we deal with it, you have to view every single person as a sensor. You know, if we were all forming a network, we'd each be an IDS. And it's our job to send it back, send anything we, that concerns us back to the big brains. They have to trust that we know what, what, what we're reporting. 
and we have to trust that they're going to take appropriate response. So you can move faster and iterate, prototype as you go. And any issues you may have will be addressed earlier in the process. Now, there are two killers to this process. Distraction and perfection. Distraction is when you're winding up in the land of boredom. You know, you're not interested in what you're doing, doing the same thing every day, you feel like it really doesn't matter, you get distracted, you lose focus. When you lose focus, you lose time. The more time you lose, the harder it is to get back to that flow state where you're responding to what's going on in the evolutionary market. Perfection is in the land of anxiety. If you're pursuing perfection, you're going in the wrong direction. You're trying too hard to make things right instead of make things good enough. So there are all sorts of ways to break this down. Um, you know, I like to use time tasks. You, know, you can actually see the time. Uh, for this particular talk. Time tasks allow you to manage your resources better because resources you're managing are resources the attackers and your competition are not managing. And the more resources you can consume for yourself, the better position you're gonna be in the next cycle, you're gonna be able to out-compete. Sprints fail because of argument. If you spend more time discussing where you wanna go, that's valuable. If you spend time arguing about where to go and not making progress, it's wasted. Success involves everybody seeing the goal and agreeing to it. Now, the reasons are going to differ. You know, you know, some people are driven by money. Some people are driven by uh, helping others. Some people are driven by wanting to change the world. Google is a company that exists to change the world. You may not like what it's changing into, but you can't deny their success. Each person has their own goal. Take DLP as an example. Anybody running DLP? Anybody tried and failed to run DLP? Each person running DLP has what's driving them. You know, your PCI person may be driven by compliance. Maybe driven by somebody else may be driven by containing trade secrets. Another people by running an investigation. And you know, you're going to have failure. Failure from misunderstanding. Failure from scarcity. There are tendencies to delay solutions until a problem is understood. And some problems cannot be 100% understood. If you, seek full, if you seek full understanding, you're seeking perfection. And you're gonna wind up in the wrong spot. If you try to have meetings and they go off topic, you're gonna have distractions, it's gonna be time wasted. Solution is gonna be constant but quick communication, which involves experimentation. Experimentation happens when you don't know what caused the problem. If all people have are guesses, people are gonna argue for favorites. You know, have you ever been in that meeting where you know, each person has their own pet theory and they're arguing for their pet theory, but you never get anywhere? You can avoid wasting time by turning guesses into theories. Guesses are debatable, theories are testable. Businesses hate theories, so we tend to call them tests. But basically, you know, suppose you have an attacker that used malware the email to hit the web. You have, data, you have evidence. You, know, you have web logs, you have email logs, you have local forensics that you can run. So you can collect the team's guesses and say, if this were true, what would that mean? And look for evidence to support it. And once the root cause is known, address the problem and move on. Now, this fails with rigid systems. Security, has everybody heard, you know, security works best in development? You know, develop it in, put it in front, it's cheaper that way, it works better that way, and nobody ever does it that way. Okay, it is cheaper. But you often have to sell it for a hack shop. You know, glue security on after the fact. There's no time, add it now. So we try to do that. But in reality, what we wind up with is a broken box. And then we isolate. You know, <laughs> big expensive solution, wall it off, let it do its thing, we'll be good, right? Well, that's not permanent. Those technologies we use to isolate things break. The technology we're isolating breaks, and it costs more and more to keep it running the way it should. With natural evolution, in this sort of situation, you're in a situation where you build something, it breaks, you rebuild it, it breaks, you rebuild it, and eventually you hope that what you're rebuilding is magically gonna work. You know, that's changed through mutation. Guided evolution is build, break, 
analyze why it broke, build again, let it break, analyze it again. That's where most businesses are today. Automated adaptation, the measure of success, the method of success, is going to require a loose coupling. Okay. This is where you know things like the Unix design philosophy come into play. You know, lots of little tools, loosely coupled, working together, allows you to make a system where if one system breaks, one component breaks, you can easily swap it back, swap it out, swap it back in. Basically, in an evolutionary security approach, you don't build to make things secure. You don't build that one box that's magically going to fix things. You build enough that's going to get you to survive the next cycle. And then if one of these things is going to make it harder to survive the next cycle, you throw it out and you put something else in its place. Surviving the next generation is what's going to matter. And uh, speed the generation time so it's not painfully long. The faster you can adapt, the faster you can move, the better off you're going to be. Um, then the next generation is going to be even better. Now, if you've seen my other presentations, you've seen these slides. Anybody seen these? Okay. A couple of people. This is the classic 80-20 rule. This is how most businesses function. Okay, you have a project, you have a budget, you spend 20% of the budget, you get 80% of the project done, and you say, okay, now it's time for the hard part. You spend the rest of the time and money to finish up the project. But security doesn't work this way. You don't get this magic perfect wall. What you wind up with is you get an 80% wall, and you burn through, and you get a little bit more. And there's always going to be this gap between a perfect that you can see and what you actually have. And you need to sustain this gap. You know, survival is where that gap's going to be, because all of the other businesses have this much security. What you can do, though, is you can build multiple walls. You know, if you build a whole bunch of walls, you know, this is that loosely coupled technology. You know, maybe it's AV working with a firewall. Maybe it's a, a SIM that's analyzing all the logs in your environment. You know, different solutions in place all together make it a lot harder for attackers to break through. So that allows you to survive to the next round to fix problems and build on successes. Now, what next round means is going to vary. You know, online retail, like I mentioned with Amazon, they have less than a day between generations. Software companies generally are weekly or bi-weekly. If you're in, a, in an agile mode, you're releasing more frequently than that. Finance tends to be yearly. You have, you have yearly budgets that are driving your generational cycles. And medical companies have to go through approval cycles. You know, they might have 20-year generations. But if everybody in the industry has the same generation cycle, the evolutionary processes will apply the same way. Now, evolution can fail. There we go. Um, evolution can fail in different ways. So how does it fail? An organism is only as robust as genetics allow. You pluck a penguin from Antarctica, plop it in the Sahara, it doesn't matter how exemplary a penguin it is, it's going to die. Organizations are similarly limited by culture. If culture is preventing you from taking advantage of your opportunities, change is not going to happen, and your organization will stagnate and die. Now, the good news is that people won't. You know, the difference between the evolutionary model I'm using and real life is when an organization dies, the people can go on to something else and successful companies will snap up the good people. Another way the system fails is if an animal can change, if it can evolve, but it lacks the resources, it's also going to die. You know, you trap a, a dog in a room with no water or food, what's going to happen? Genetics are irrelevant here. In business, this is the resources. Money, people, and time. Without those, even if the culture of a business supports change, change isn't going to happen and the organization's going to die. The good news is, if you start putting more resources into a culture that supports change, the fewer resources it's going to take each subsequent cycle to drive that change. This is that snowball effect they talk about in business books. You know, investment in technology, process, and learning is getting cheaper every day. And finally, evolution requires breeding. Two individuals 
reproduce by combining genes. And the offspring inherits both parents over time, resulting in better and better individuals. In business, this takes the form of ideas. We get ideas from other firms, from the internet, from books, articles, and conferences like this. However, they're only successful if they're transmitted, which requires discussion, or as I call it, infosex. Finally, a laugh. Not much of one, you guys can do better. Organizations that don't do this are like small inbred populations and will die. Now the good news is the internet has all made us promiscuous. Lots of ideas are being shared. And there are lots of things you can use to drive this discussion and what's going on. So, these are my rules for creating change. The first rule is to maximize time. Predetermine how valuable knowledge is. You know, knowledge has a value. It's not perfect. You know, if, if knowledge were everything, then the academic institutions would be ruling the world. So there's a definite value there. And you know, look at how much time you're spending learning versus how much time you're spending doing versus how much time you're spending teaching. And if those numbers aren't right, adjust them. You know, some information is only worth five minutes. And if you spend 10 minutes poking around on the internet, you know, two of them on Facebook, it's not going to be helpful. Others, like a, a full you know, maximum pen test, could take a couple of months. And that information might be valuable enough to warrant that for you. You have to think about that before you invest. Second is don't oversell. The easiest way to kill a change process is to tell people everything's going to change and not be able to make that happen. So start small, say we're just going to focus on this, we're going to make this happen, and if you can successfully make that happen, you'll be given more resources for the next evolutionary cycle. And then you'll be able to make bigger and bigger and bigger changes. Don't cover your ass. This only works if everybody involved is honest. Remember how I talked about how you have to trust everybody? You have to trust the people at the low levels, they have to trust the people at the high levels, everybody in the middle has to talk. You know, if you're not, freely communicating these ideas, then uh, you know, it's, it's just not going to work. And finally, be lucky. Genetics is about luck. You know, there's a certain element of mutation that you have to accept, but you can maximize your chances with passion. By focusing on how you want to change things, by focusing on what sort of metrics you want to use, what sort of approach you want to take, uh, you're going to be more successful. It's going to take more energy, but if you think it's worth it, it's going to be easier for you to do. So that uh, takes me to the end of my talk. Uh, I don't give out my PowerPoint slides. I turn them into comic books. Uh, if you have not seen my Lean Security 101, you can download it from that QR code there. I really, really wanted to have the Evolutionary Security comic done now, but I had surgery instead. Sorry. Um, so wait for all the phones and tablets to go down uh, while we're waiting. Any questions? Really, no questions. Yes. So this is great. I, I enjoy the animal evolutionary tactic and flight of security, and that's a good way to learn and talk about lessons. So my question is this, and I'd love to hear your perspective of this, but I've been doing research on the threats that we had 10 years ago. We had, you know, emails at the, the infancy, so to speak, maybe, maybe not. But we had you know, spear phishing, we had spam, we had denial of service. We still have those things. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, my question for you is why do we still have so many problems with 10-year-old threats? You know what the number one killer of humans is? Mosquitoes. Number two killer is humans. We can't make the old things go away. You know, we have all sorts of technology to keep mosquitoes from killing people. We have all sorts of rules to keep humans from killing people. And it's been going on for thousands of years. Instead of saying, why are they not going away? The question is, and it's, it's, not, a kind, it, it's not a kind question, but we're talking evolution and state of warfare here, right? The question is, how can we set things up so the damaging attacks only kill the things we don't care about? 
like Windows XP. Um, as, as an industry, 15 years ago, we decided, and part of my language, screw the consumers. We completely ignored security issues for home users. Said, not our problem, we don't want to deal with it, we don't want to take phone calls. You know, we have a handful of companies out there sell antivirus that deals with them, but nobody has a single magic box they can put in place, and no company is willing to stand up and say, we are willing to take on the responsibility of protecting these users from themselves. Okay? We have now made the decision, screw XP users. Okay? Handful of companies, mostly in the application whitelisting space, are saying, we're going to give it a try. You know, th there's there's some, some value here, we're going to try, but mostly as an industry, we said that's a problem we don't want to solve. Because we see more success moving in that direction than in trying to stem those attacks. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Partially. I, I think the issue comes in the decision making of what you're going to let die of what you're going to die. You know what I'm saying? And, oh, and yeah. I mean, so to your, to your discussion, I mean, hope you don't mind the discussion, but you'll get malaria pills, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have. NATO and the United Nations to help with the people killing themselves. So I think that's how it's evolved there. So I, I hear, you, I see what you're saying, but that takes a lot of collaboration, oh, a it, lot of discussion. So I think that's the dilemma right now is where are those discussions actually happening? Now here's, here's my kicker on this. Is it going to take a regulation or a law to solve this problem? Or will people or businesses solve it on their own? Um, that's the question. Personally, I don't think the problem will be solved. Okay. Um, interesting thing about regulations is when they work, it brings everybody to the same level, which means it tells all the attackers, don't try anything here, focus here. If it doesn't work, it tells the attackers, go ahead, keep focusing here. Regulations are helpful in controlling uh, public perception in letting people feel that things are getting done, and in making sure the most egregious things are not happening. Um, you can't regulate a problem away. You know, all that does, it's, it's like trying to, well, it's like trying to get your cat out from under the bed sheets. You know, you can move them here, or you can move them there, but you can't really get them out without taking the sheet up and fixing the entire situation. Um, just like the, the discussion thing, business, Business is not incentivized to fix the problems either. The market economics make it so businesses are incentivized to fix the problem for the class of people with the money, with the resources, and ignore everything else. So I would love to live in a world where we could deal with these problems. I would love to live in a world where the entire world said, you know, we have the resources to make polio no longer exist. We did it with smallpox. We actually can do it with polio, but it's making a comeback. You know, we have the ability to make to wipe out malaria a little harder, but we can do it. And we've all decided not to because the places those problems are, the people with the resources don't seem to care about. And that's the same thing we're seeing in information security. You know, the companies with the biggest money and the largest amount of intellectual property are looking to protect themselves, not everybody else. slide so you've got my contact info. And uh, so while we're standing here, I will be reprising an earlier talk. There was a speaker that had to drop, so I'll be back uh, tomorrow morning, 9.45, no idea which room, uh, talking about assessing vendors. So if that's of interest.
right, I guess we're done. Thank you very much, John.